Uh, welcome uh, uh, to our online version of our worship service. We are uh, uh, appreciative that you're here with us, and I, I hear from many of you throughout the week that uh, you've appreciated this time to uh, to be with us in the in your home and with your cup of coffee and um, with whatever clothes you are wearing in the privacy of your own home, but that's okay with us because we don't know. Um, so um, we, we're continuing to pray for Mark Albrecht. He, as I had said last, um, well, I didn't say last week, uh, he, he, the, he, the brain tumor was removed successfully. He's having some struggles in his recovery time, so we'll keep him in prayer. He's got a long, long road to recovery and also then more radiation and other where the cancer is in other parts of his body. So we'll keep him in prayer. Uh, school, our preschool is doing well. We've actually increased uh, from when we started to, to from 80 to, to 100. And so we're actually at maximum. And we're tr trying to add some more classes, trying to get some more teachers. But uh, it's always good to go up. And so that's what we're doing. We're very happy about that. So kids are in school. We had a great confirmation class in person in the fellowship hall. In spite of all the kids wearing their masks, we got through it. So uh, the Lord is blessing uh, the ministry here, and we thank you for uh, praying for us. So let's begin our time together as we begin with the invocation. We gather in the name of the Holy Trinity, one God in three persons. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, the word of God says to us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess yes, so that we, we are in bondage, bondage to sin, sin and cannot, cannot free, free ourselves. ourselves. We have we sinned against you in thought, word, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear these words to those who believe them in faith. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Lord God, God you call us to work, work in your vineyard and leave no one standing idle. Set, set us to our tasks in the work of your kingdom 
and help us to order our lives by your wisdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, this morning or this day, I'm, I'm reading uh, my, I'm doing the readings. I haven't done this ever, I think, as a pastor in 22 years, but this is my first time. Uh, the first reading comes from Isaiah, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And the word of the Lord says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled upon. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they do not, they, they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. The second reading comes to us from Philippians, the third chapter. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the house of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, the persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, based on faith. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and the, sh and, and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Uh, the Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest had come, he sent his slaves to, to the tenants to collect his produce, but the tenant seized the slaves, his slaves, and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, 
he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. But Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Um, Before we begin to look at the Word of God today, let's uh, ask God to bless his word and its uh, its speaking and its preaching and uh, our hearing. Lord, we thank you for your word, and I pray that you would bless it. Uh, Bless the message to us today. Fill me with your spirit as I preach it. Bless all those who hear it by the same spirit, that we might hear the word uh, and uh, be challenged by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today uh, we're looking again at Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is the third in the series um, looking at this. And as the third in the series, we're in the third chapter. And last week we considered the word attitude as sort of the main focus of our, of our thoughts, centering that attitude around the person and work and presence of, of Jesus Christ in our lives. Uh, his attitude as opposed to the, the selfish ambition and vain conceit that Paul was challenging us to move away from. And that attitude of Christ is that of a servant who follows that downward journey, um, uh, the downward journey of Christ and ultimately that led to the cross. Um, have this kind of attitude, Paul says, that he, and he t- says this to, to the church back in Philippi and the church today at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church. <clears throat> so um, that was last week, that was chapter two, and now we're moving on to chapter three of the same letter. And, and whereas last week's word was attitude, uh, the word that I want us to focus on this week is confidence. Confidence. I heard of a pastor one time who thought that, that he knew everything about how things worked in the church office. And one day, the secretary saw him standing in front of a paper shredder with a puzzled look on his face. And uh, she asked him, can I help you with something? And the pastor said, well, this is a very sensitive document. It's very important. And, and I think this thing is broken. Can you make it work for me? And um, certainly, the secretary said. And so she took the piece of paper, uh, turned on the machine, and pushed the button. And as the paper disappeared into the shredder, the pastor said, very good, Uh, I just need one copy. False confidence is what you have before you fully understand the problem. What Paul is writing about in chapter 3 of Philippians is the importance of having the right kind of confidence. He was writing into a situation in the church where where some people were teaching a form of Christianity that was false. And and part of the reason why it it was false was because these false teachers didn't understand the problem. So what was the problem that was causing people to have this false confidence? Uh, Paul writes, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Uh, One of the challenges that Paul faced constantly as he went around uh, uh, the the Middle East and Asia Minor and into parts of Europe One of the challenges that he had was to convince people that God saved people, saving people, which means he he forgave them, redeemed them, gave them righteousness, and all the inheritance of God, including eternal life. 
He saved people, God saved people through faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, according to Paul's teaching, had the power to save the world of its core problem, which was sin. But this message that God was the great savior and, and that there was nothing we could do to add on to what he's already done in Christ was a hard sell to, to most people, especially some people who, who, who had a long tradition of feeling like they had to do certain things to merit God's favor. And there's a natural tendency for all of us because of our natural and sinful human tendency to believe that there is something we have to do to earn God's favor. How could that be a free gift to us? We just doesn't fit into our, our way of thinking. And in the early church, there were, there were some people who were teaching that you couldn't really be a good Christian unless you were first uh, circumcised. Um, apparently women were exempted this, from this rule for obvious reasons. But the, their message was that there was a religious ritual that they had to perform in order to be assured of salvation. Jewish male Christians were coming to Christ and they had this done already. It's simply part of their religious heritage. Um, but some teachers were saying to the Gentiles who were coming into the faith, who were coming to Christ, that they also had to do this. The message was that before they became Christians, they had to become Jewish according to the law, and then they could become uh, Christians. In other words, they were saying that there was something else that we needed to do or they needed to do in order to receive God's grace. And that was becoming a major a stumbling block throughout the early church. Whenever, whenever Paul would plant a church, uh, there were these people that would come along and say, grace, the gospel of grace was not good enough. You have to add these uh, religious uh, exercises. In fact, the whole letter to, Paul's letter to the Galatians uh, confronts this very issue. And so Paul suggests in that letter, you either are saved by faith or your own efforts. You can't have both. But, fal but this false confidence in their obedience to an external law uh, was based, of course, on a false teaching. They certainly did not understand the core problem. And the real problem was sin. The sin is a condition we cannot free ourselves through our own efforts. So that includes religious uh, rituals. Try as we might. Three years ago, uh, this is 2020, two, three years ago we were um, celebrating the, the 500th anniversary of the, of the Reformation uh, where Luther nailed the 95 theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg, Germany. And during that time we showed the Luther movie. Some of you may have seen that. Uh, there's like been three or four versions of that since the 1950s. Um, it, for the newest one, you may remember the opening scene where Luther is running along the road uh, in the middle of a thunderstorm, and a lightning bolt slams right near him, and he falls to the ground. And uh, he really thought that God was trying to kill him uh, because of all his sins. And years later, Luther wrote that, that when, he, during this thunderstorm, he cried out in fear, help me, Saint Anne, and I will become a monk. And Saint and was the patron saint of miners. His father was a miner. And, uh, and it was thought in Luther's day, and Luther thought this, that if you went into the religious orders, a priest or a monk or, or things like that, then that would be a better guarantor of your salvation than just the regular people. Luther put his confidence in his ability to do something in order to receive salvation. But when Luther finally understood the good news of salvation in Christ alone, by grace, and by faith alone, he gave up his false confidence for a sure confidence in the Lord. And St. Paul followed a similar road. He says in Philippians 3, 4 through 7, if anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, and flesh means is symbolic of all the things that we do with our own human efforts. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. 
this is a list of seven things. In this thing, in this, in this verse, set of verses, Paul is throwing out seven uh, reasons why if anybody could earn favor with God, it would have been him. If, if there was anyone that had the best of religious credentials, Paul would have had them. Seven uh, was the number, the, the, the biblical number and the Hebrew number for perfection. And basically, in, in, in listing seven things, he could have listed 10, he could have listed 20 things, but he chose seven things to add up to seven. And he's seeing that, 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 that he used to have confidence that, that because he was the perfect Jew, he performed all the religious duties. If anyone was saved, it would be him. Paul was deeply invested, and he performed all the religious expectations that he had of his faith. And he was deeply invested in the idea that everyone, especially every Jew, needed to see the God the same way, even to the point of murdering and imprisoning Christians. And in his time, when he was doing that, all of the Christians were converted Jews. That is, until Paul himself met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And you could read that story in the book of Acts, the ninth chapter. Paul or Saul, as he was known in the ninth chapter, was on his way, as we, we know, to persecute more Christians outside of Jerusalem. And on his way, Jesus appeared to him as a, as a blinding light on the road, and, and, and he fell off his horse, and as he was lying uh, on the ground, Jesus gives him this famous line, Saul, Saul, why are you kicking against the goads? Most people today don't know what a goad is, so I'm going to explain it to you. A goad was like a, a spear with a sharp uh, tip that was tied to the, along the side of the ox. And if the ox turned his head the wrong way or the other way, it would stick him. And in that way, a farmer could keep uh, the ox going straight in the right direction. So the Lord is saying uh, to Paul... This way that you are, are pursuing your understanding of God, this path that you are on is the wrong one. And not only that, it's hurting you. And in that encounter with the Lord Jesus, Paul found the true God as revealed in Jesus who would love and accept him by faith and grace alone. And from then on, Paul's passion was to teach and preach that we can place our confidence in Christ and only the Lord himself. The writer to the book of Hebrews, who some scholars believe is Paul himself, though others might say other people like Barnabas, Hebrews says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So going back to the, to the letter of the, to the Philippians, chapter 3, Paul tells the church about the seven things that he used to put his confidence in. Seven things that he thought would uh, put him in a good standing for God to accept him. And then having encountered Jesus, everything changed. He says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more... I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may be found that I might gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through Christ, which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is by faith. He says, Paul is telling them here that he used to have great confidence in himself. Uh, because of his zeal for following the religious requirements of the law, he thought of himself as, as kind of a big deal from a spiritual perspective. And in his arrogance and self-righteousness, he thought that because of all that he had done, that God would think of him as a big deal too. But that confidence that he used to have in himself was replaced by the knowledge of Christ Jesus as his Savior 
and as his righteousness. Christ himself and nothing that Paul did would become his claim to truly being righteous. Now in terms of um, application, uh, how do we hear this word? Um, I, I think there are a lot of different ways that people need to hear this word, and, and there are a lot of ways that people will tend to hear this word. It's, it's often different for every person, but those, for example, <clears throat> that might struggle with guilt or shame and inadequacy might be overjoyed with this word um, because it is the gospel, and, and the gospel in that message pours out upon us the blessings of God in our laps and gives us union with Christ and through Christ with the Father. This is good news. All of our sins forgiven, past, present, and future. Some might hear it that way, and that's a good way of hearing it. Others might hear this word and need to be humbled and, and be saved from an inappropriate sense of self-confidence based on their confidence in their own religious performance or piety or whatever else. And that's a word that some people need to hear as well. Now, I think another way we might hear this word today is to, to hear it in the context of the world in which we live today, and especially the world that we experience in this part of the Northwest, a secular place that, uh, that places no confidence in God and mostly doubts that God even exists. That's where we live. And in that context... Uh, we often feel as Christians afraid to identify ourselves as followers of Jesus. We're often afraid that, that people might think low, less of us or, or not as intelligent or, or maybe narrow-minded or something. We lack the confidence to say what Paul said about the Lord. Now, we also live in the context in our country and, of course, much of the Western world where the overall percentage of Christians is, has, is declining, especially this began in Europe many decades ago. It's begun in the, United, been in the United States for quite a long time now. Church members are shrinking in every, every demographic. Things are going down. And this, this has, has caused many believers to be shaken in their confidence. Um, Sometimes we, we feel anxious about that situation. We don't know how to turn it around. But God's word might say to all of us in that context, be confident. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Be confident. You know the Lord in whom you believe. He is both our life and the truth, in spite of what anyone else may say. And nothing that we can see with our eyes, even what's going on all around us, nothing we can see with our eyes changes the fact that God can be our confidence because he is our life and our truth. So let's be confident. May the Lord establish our confidence as a church in him and in him alone, both now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you.
let us confess together the ancient creed uh, found um, is in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. And uh, before we begin, I, wanted, I forgot to mention at the beginning that uh, this past week, uh, uh, Lurleen, uh, Lurleen's husband, Fred, passed away uh, after uh, his battle with cancer, so we'll pray for her too. Lord, I pray for, um, before I pray for anything, Lord, I pray that your word that we hear this morning would soak into our lives that you would give us the confidence uh, that, that all of our faith placed in Christ um, by faith and grace alone will result in the blessings and the inheritance of God being poured out upon us, including his forgiveness and spirit and eternal life and the righteousness that is not ours but is, is, is given to us by faith. Lord, give us confidence in this age in which we live where we are sometimes afraid to speak the word of Christ to our neighbors and friends, even to sometimes admit that we are followers of Jesus and Christians. Give us boldness, Lord. Give us confidence uh, and, and give us the joy that comes from knowing that, that knowing Christ is, is better than anything that we can know in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Uh, we pray for those uh, in our church suffering, especially we pray for Lurleen, who's lost her husband of so, so, so many years this week, for uh, her husband, Fred. And I ask you to bless her and bless her two sons. And I ask that you would um, comfort her in this time as, as she they're thinking about uh, a service. And I pray that, um, that um, your love would surround her. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Pray for our brother, Mark Albrecht, who's recovering from his, his, uh, the, the surgery to remove the tumors, the cancerous tumors in his brain, and his, his struggle of recovery has been difficult. I pray for him. Lord, I pray for wisdom for the doctors to know how to continue to treat him. Lord, bring healing to all the cancer that has spread throughout different parts of his body. Um, do a miracle in his life, as you have done many miracles in his life in the past. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for blessing our, our preschool and uh, the increased in enrollments. Um, and we just thank you for that, Lord. And, and we're on a, on a little more solid footing than before. Bless them. Protect all of our kids from any kind of virus. Um, I pray that you would put a hedge of protection around this school uh, that, that's been in our possession as a ministry of our church for 47 years. Lord, bless it. In Jesus' name, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Continue to bless all of our kids in our church and those in our community as they go to school. And I pray our kids uh, would uh, be blessed with faith. And thank you for the ministries that we have to pass on the faith of the gospel to them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, again, as we pray, we pray for our country. We pray for our government from the president on down. We pray that your will and your wisdom uh, would be expressed amongst the various parts of our, our country. Lord, we need you. 
uh, we need repentance, we need revival. Um, Lord, only you can save us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And I'll pause for a few moments to allow you at home uh, to be praying for those people, those concerns that you are thinking about right now. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us continue with the way, with praying the way Jesus himself taught the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And uh, before we uh, leave you, to, to sing, if you'd like, the song, The Joy of the Lord, I want to thank you again for joining us uh, this day and uh, your prayers, and we uh, uh, appreciate that. Continue to pray for us. Uh, uh, being the church of our day is a difficult task, um, and we are all struggling in one form or another, but we have confidence that the Lord will get us through, and the Lord will complete his mission in our lives. May that be so uh, with us here and those of you listening at home. Until next week. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Father's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. Father's home in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy and the